episode 26, connecting, remembering what really matters during a pandemic with the one and only Peter Brindley. Sup? Welcome to Solving Healthcare. I'm Quadro Caramante. I'm an ICU and palliative care physician here in Ottawa and the founder of Resource Optimization Network. We are on a mission to transform healthcare in Canada. I'm going to talk with physicians, nurses, administrators, patients, and their families because inefficiencies, overwork, and overcrowding affects us all. I believe it's time for a better healthcare system that's more cost-effective, dignified, and just for everyone involved. People, we are changing the boogie. Let me tell you something. Thank you for listening, first of all. I, I just want to thank everybody for the donations that they've been making for our GoFundMe page, which is helping to feed frontline healthcare providers and also helping to f- uh, support our community. The, the response has been tremendous. I also want to thank, for, thank all you guys for the support, for helping uh, with our Bridges Over Barriers fund as well to support kids in need out in the community. Like all this interventions are making a difference. I'm it's April 6th when I'm doing this intro and I'm in ICU and I got to tell you the morale, the shift in mindset that I've seen uh, and talked when I talked to my fellow colleagues, has been amazing. And it's, it's a pleasure to be here with my team. And this is all about connection. And this is why I, I, we released this episode. Actually, it's an interview I did with Peter Brindley, in November 2019, but we thought this is the time to release it. I'm in the ICU currently, and the need for us to be connecting, not just in ICU, but through, throughout society during this pandemic, I think is such an important message. You know, I, I saw my first patient pass away in the, in the COVID era, where we're only allowed one visitor at a, at a time, and, and we're all surrounding this poor patient wearing all our personal protective equipment. It, it's its a very, unfortunately, an unnatural way to go, and it's also disconnected. And so I think this interview I did with Peter really emphasized the value of how, you know, getting to know our patients now, getting to know our colleagues, getting to be at one with our families is so important now during this challenging time. So this is the reason why this episode is coming out now. We'll still be busting out some more COVID content throughout the the next little while, but I I just think this is such an important message. The other thing too, in this, in this awesome conversation with Dr. Brennan, we do cover the, the importance of, of less emphasis on biomedical and more focusing on connection, how that does provide better care and provide more authentic interactions amongst us among us so let me tell you a little bit about our guest peter brindley he's an intensivist out in at the university of alberta in edmonton he's an attending physician and associate director in the intensive care unit as well as a full professor in critical care medicine at the u of a he has over a hundred peer-reviewed publications and manuscripts and Here's the gem. I can't wait for you guys to hear this conversation. So without further ado, my boy, Dr. Peter Brindley. Dr. Peter Brindley, welcome to the quadcast. Aren't you kind? Thank you for having me. Thank you for, for appearing. Do you, out of curiosity, remember the first time we met or any encounter that we, between ourselves? KK, how could I forget? It's it's indelibly at, into my mind. <laughs> It's one of the pivotal moments of my life. Forget my children being born. Forget my wedding day. Right, right. It it was meeting you when you were but a wee slip of a lad, but a trainee full of vinegar. And now you're just, the vinegar's all gone. Yeah, I'll never forget it because you were running one of the stations for ACES course. So it's like uh, a course before we start our ICU training, and I had somebody on the other line. I was taking a phone call of some ultra unstable neurologic patient, and the, the the doctor on the other side was fumbling and doing all these crazy things, and I was at a loss. And at one point, I just said, "Well, whatever you're doing is not awesome, so uh, just stop it." And I I, I got that uh, feedback for the rest of the weekend, being like. 
everyone tell me, oh, yeah, by the way, that's not awesome. I have a feeling that became yours and my shorthand and, and your catchphrase henceforth. I, <laughs> you should just point out to anyone that's listening, goodness knows if there is anyone, um, <laughs> that, was, that was a simulation. That was not a, yes. a real patient case. Uh, all of the patients were, no patients were harmed in the making of that simulation. That was yeah. a simulating telephone calls, which is a yep. vital part of our job. And surprisingly, something that's low technology but incredibly high fidelity, and I think more should be done. Uh, yeah, I mean, that kind of simulation says putting if you think about how much that has changed in the last 10 years, it's it's been crazy. And I think there's a lot of value there. And this might tie into our conversation, but from your perspective, you've been at the helm of doing critical care for I don't know how long. I don't want to guess. It's about, it's about, 20, <laughs> it's about 20 years. You can tell in the quiver in my voice that it's been. <laughs> and you've seen a lot and you've written about a lot. And I'm quite curious to hear from your perspective, what in our current healthcare environment would you like to see fixed? What can we improve on in general? That's a great, general, profound question to start out with. Uh, I, I would preface by saying the whole thing isn't broken. Um, and so uh, whether it's a fix or whether it's a tweak is, uh, is up for debate. My own interests and where I hope to contribute a little bit and where I would like to see our discussion go is more in the realm of our culture. Now, there's a danger that that word means everything and nothing simultaneously and sort of sage heads will nod in agreement because how can you disagree? And others will say, what the blinking heck does that mean? But if I can ramble, as I'm prone to do, my interest in critical care all started in resuscitation. Mm -hmm. And the journey I've gone on, journey being a unnecessarily pompous word but the journey i've gone on was initially how do we save people what are the skills required and that moved from basic sort of acls atls very biomedical stuff then into how do teams work together then in terms of of how do you actually keep yourself strong and resilient uh for the next case that's required of you. And now I see it more into our, our larger culture in terms of how do we talk to families about whether that's the right thing for them? How do mm -hmm. we keep ourselves going, not just through the rest of the day, but over a 20-year career? Because after everything you've sacrificed to be a doc, and after all the weekends you've worked, and after all the super-duper-duper subspecialization, we need to keep you around, and we need that wisdom over 20 years, not just two years. Mm. And, and equally, uh, I'd even go back to the beginning and challenge whether our biomedical focus slash obsession to the exclusion of all others is, is even where we ought to be going. In other words, is it what patients want? Do they truly want more machines, more whiz-bangery, or do they actually want more of a connection, a sense of community? Equally for those of us on the delivery end of healthcare, what will sustain us? And I think it is a sense of community and connection and meaning. Uh, they used to say that to be truly happy in your job and your life, and so in that way it, it applies to both patients and to providers, you need purpose, a sense that it matters, autonomy, mm -hmm. a sense that what's going to be done is, is right for you and if you're delivering is the right thing and mastery, so purpose, autonomy, and mastery. And I fear that healthcare could just go into mastery, where, in other words, you and I know what to do from a biotechnical point of view, uh, but we've not put sufficient time into purpose and autonomy, in other words, working out whether it's the right thing and uh, working out whether the patients want it and whether all the glorious, impressive effort that is put into modern tertiary quaternary care healthcare is a proper return on the taxpayer's money. Sorry to ramble. There's a right. lot in there, as you can imagine. We can part every strain of that over the next little bit. But that's where my febrile mind is right now. And that's what I'd like to dedicate my last 10 years in this otherwise glorious profession to uh, sorting out both for myself and for my patients, and for a specialty that I love, but worry, but worry, we may be losing the plot. So 
what has driven this? Like, what are you seeing that has made you question whether, you know, our approach in terms of being aggressive with care, being more advanced with our our biomedical resuscitations or being able to maintain life as best we can. What have you seen that makes you question whether we're doing the right thing? Well, I think I've seen the same thing that everybody else has seen. Healthcare is an incredible thing. The ability to coordinate so many people, so many supplies, to deliver it all in a big shiny hospital to all comers, whether they're rich, poor, young, old, religious, or secular, is a truly magnificent thing. And there have been times when I've stepped back and looked at it from 10, 15 feet away, as you get to do as you become an older staff person and other younger docs are jumping in and doing the the actual resuscitation. But so it is a magnificent thing. But I, I fear at times we're doing it because we can. We're doing it because... You know, there's a beautiful quote that says um, two weeks in the intensive care unit avoids one hour of a difficult conversation. Mm. In other words, even though it's incredibly complex and nuanced, the delivery of healthcare, it almost becomes easy to do the incredibly high tech stuff rather than the connection, rather than the sit down and talk to somebody, hold their hand or even ahead of time for people to feel like they're part of communities. And therefore, the idea of giving up their community and becoming, you know, part of the the sort of medical industrial complex, before I get entirely carried away, is is a a switch they're prepared to make. Mm. You know, most people, I don't, I, I think people envisage the ICU as I'm going to go in with a quickly fixable problem, I'm going to get better from that quickly fixable problem, and then I'm going to go back to the life that I had before. And that is is ICU when it is truly a glorious thing that I would want for me, that I would want for my family members, my community. And by the way, I do see the hospital's role as being part of the community. I live in Edmonton, and it is a thing that looks after all of our community. So it is one of the glues that holds community together. But... When we lose the plot, I fear that we say, well, there's a machine available, so let's just put the machine on, uh, Mm -hmm. regardless of whether this person's going to get back to a meaningful quality of life, regardless of whether they or we have even sat down and thought about what a meaningful quality of life is. I mean, to reinforce what you're saying, Peter, people don't realize, like the general public doesn't realize how hard it is to die in 2019. Like it really, it it really is uh, it difficult. Like if you think about in your intensive care unit or intensive care units throughout the the continent, most of the time if someone dies, it's because we withdraw life sustaining therapy or w- withdraw the machines, and it's not because of we've tried everything in our, our power and everything else else has failed. Like that does happen, but that's not the common scenario. And I I can't express enough how. We as a, a group, clinicians, society, whatever you want to call it, need to think about, is this a tool that's going to help you get to where you want to be? Is this going to be able to, are we going to be able to help you achieve your goal? And I, I, I wish we asked that question more often. I, I think that's absolutely beautifully put. Instead of the awful, almost cowardly conversation where the doctor simply says, do you want us to do everything without then defining what everything means? And, and in fact, the, the pain and the difficulty that comes along with everything. We need to have conversations that are far more along the lines of what is truly meaningful to you? What are you prepared to give up? Because unfortunately, critical illness is a pretty harrowing thing. And much of the time, you will be less than you were going in when you come out, especially if you're older and especially if you're frail, which is a larger and larger subset of the, the population that we see. It, you know, I was on for the trauma service yesterday, and trauma in comparison is easier because it's typically younger people with few pre-existing medical complaints, whereas increasingly my weeks in the ICU are people with a burden of many, many illnesses and they are declining just as a 50-year-old man, I'm beginning to slowly decline. So I think the conversations have to be far more, what are you prepared to give up? Because I'm very sorry, 
but you will be less than you were by the time you come out of this ICU. And what are you never prepared to give up? Because I promise you, as a healthcare provider, I will make sure that it never comes to that impasse. I will look out for you and fight and fight and fight, not just to keep your heart going, but to keep your quality of life and those things that you've said are most precious to you. Mm -hmm. The danger is, and sorry to... No, no, keep going, keep going. Sorry sorry to try and jam this in, but I almost fear, and I've never expressed this, so if it comes out awkwardly, I apologize, but I almost fear that high-tech medicine prevents us ever having that conversation because we don't have to in a way exactly in other words instead of uh, it was a large part of one's life centuries ago to prepare for death you know as alex Cerides points out in the old days nobody ever saw sex but everybody saw death and now we've flipped that on their heads where nobody ever sees death and i'm not going to talk about your social life kk but (laughs) the point being (laughs) That it it's become the new don't talk about it. Yeah. Um, in fact, it's exactly what we need to talk about. And I fear our biomedical advances, incredible as they are, and incredible as I've benefited from them, and my family has benefited from them, at the same time, the sting in the tail is that we now don't prepare for death. We don't talk about this stuff. We say, oh, oh they'll sort it out uh, when the time comes. And when the time comes collectively, patients, providers, the system, the ease of which we can hook people up to machines means that we don't actually address it. We just sort of witness it. And I think your point about it's incredibly hard to die is a very, very important, clever, insightful point that we all ought to spend sort of many days just sitting on the top of a mountain and thinking about. Yeah. And I, you know, just a couple of points to, to reinforce what you're saying is, you know, part of this platform on this show is to just increase the awareness of how our lack of discussions around death is detrimental to everybody. Like, not only to yourselves, but to your loved ones, that burden you could put on your loved one by not having these discussions is huge. That's my first point. Second, what I would love to see if when we talk about all these advances in biomedical technologies is I want to see stuff that gets us, not just sustains our life, but gets us more functional. I think we need to celebrate some of the more of the innovations that people are doing that will get you back on that golf course, back to that yoga class, back to whatever you love to do, and stuff that will actually help you achieve your goals. And I think this is where I would want to see us, us head towards. And then the other point, I just want to make sure I, I don't because I'm, I'm hearing you mention this a lot and I, I don't want to ignore it is that element of connecting and, and how to achieve that. And actually, I, one of the questions I want to ask you too, Pete, is like, what made you like, usually this is not something that, you know, you hear residents talk about or people early in their careers talk about, but what made you want to have that increased connection or value it more? in terms of whether it's with the care team, with the families that we're, we're interacting with, with the, with the patients, what has driven this? Like, what, what got you there? Well, there's nothing special about me. I'm a human being, and I think we all want connection. You know, I'm the son of a scientist. I'm the son of a palliative care counselor. And so increasingly, as my career goes on, the more I feel that mum had it right, not that dad, dad the scientist, not that mum the counselor was all right and dad was all wrong, but I, I think it's where we all get to in our lives that in the early days you connect by challenging the system, by taking it on, by climbing to the top of your profession, by becoming president of this and president of that. And you know, there's a wonderful book by David Brooks uh, where he talks about a two-mountain model to happiness and the first mountain you climb is the mountain of success uh and then you you typically you have a fall uh and then you climb up a mountain of significance and i think significance is all about connecting it's you know it's not just learning and earning it's returning giving something back and feeling more whole as a person yourself and Mm -hmm. so 
I think it's very important that we don't frame this conversation as, oh, those ridiculous patients expecting ridiculous stuff, or for that matter, our colleagues in other specialties just pushing the problem onto you and I, because I think I think that's too it's too self-serving for critical care. It's too easy for anyone to play the victim. So the last thing I'm going to allow is my specialty to play the victim, even though we do all feel a bit beaten up by the sort of avalanche of do everything, do everything, do everything. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I've had my own health problems. My family's had their own health problems. And I, I see on both sides, I think we do an enormous amount of busy work and running around and fussing and trying to become successful and dominating and domineering. When in fact, most of us just, I don't care if any of this sounds a bit gushy, but we just want to connect with people. We want to be loved. We want to be listened to. And instead, you've got a, a sort of world and society of people trying to talk over each other. So in the medical mm -hmm. field, that's doctors and nurses butting heads and acting like sort of rutting animals on the savannah where we're <laughs> do i mean rutting no i don't think i do mean rutting i mean competing animals <laughs> we're, again we're back to your weekend kk but yeah yeah it was it was crazy weekend um... <laughs> <laughs> but you know all that squabbling and fighting and and i can only win if you lose all that sort of stuff that that sustained me through my teenage years and 20 20s and 30s and you know i could fight and squabble and, and argue as well as the best of them. And I see the same thing for our poor patients. They get thrown into this massive impersonal system and they sort of have to fight and complain and, and raise their voices to be heard or, or connected with. And instead of us putting all of this sort of adrenal energy into everything we do, I think, you know, it's time for less dopamine and more oxytocin as sort of more of a connection and i i know it sounds woolly and i know it sounds non-specific but i'm increasingly taking pride in going into a situation and giving away power instead of sort of trying to demonstrate my power so go into a situation and think what does a colleague need out of this situation what does my patient need out of this do i have the power to provide that then i'm going to or I feel like this poor person's healthcare wishes aren't what they'll, in retrospect, wish they had fought for. So, so that we can avoid all of that, for the next half an hour, I'm just going to do a lot more listening than I normally do. In other words, I'm going to try and connect with this person on a human level to see if this is truly what they want. Now, we've done a terrible job of explaining what intensive care does and what it doesn't do. And as a result, we shouldn't be surprised that patients and families are saying, I want everything, I want everything. Because for years, we've been telling them that we've got all the answers and this stuff is great and give us more taxpayers money because what we do is such honorable, terrific stuff. So I don't think we can blame families if they then turn around and say, but I want it all. Why aren't you giving it to me? Mm -hmm. And equally, the burnout thing, which is it's a very complex discussion and, and the terms are used in a very lazy sense. But part of that is because people are saying to us, help me with this, help me with this. Uh, and our initial answer is it's not going to help you. And that we, we're stuck in this very awkward catch 22. of This is all I have to offer you, but I don't want to offer it to you because I don't think it's yeah. what you really want. But then again, it's all I can offer. And so that's where I feel we're stuck. And, and I think that's where some of the burnout and moral distress comes from. There is moral distress when you can't do what you know to be right and what you feel you were trained for. Now, the closest I've ever felt to moral distress is when they brought the computer system in, in my hospital, and I couldn't get the treatments I wanted for my patient because computer says no. Um, and, and I felt that very much as a, as a moral distress. I finally understood moral distress, which in the past I had sort of worried was people just trying to find an excuse and not wanting to do difficult aspects of their job. But the taxpayer pays you, so do those difficult aspects. But I finally started to experience that moral distress when I couldn't do what I knew to be right. I would mm -hmm. take it even further, though. I think we're feeling moral distress 
because, as you say, healthcare is a tool. And, a, you know, if a hammer's a tool, you can build a house, which is a glorious thing, or you can smash a window, which is, a, which is just vandalism with a hammer. And I think our biomedical focus runs the risk of being the wrong sort of tool. Impressive as it is, if we could just connect more, if we could just have a greater sense of wider community, you know, let's get off these teams of doctor versus nurse, but let's also get off these teams of healthcare provider versus healthcare recipient. You know, right now that's, uh, you know, we put on our lab coats, we use all our titles, we refer to people as patients, not people. You've probably felt this yourself, KK, when you bump into people who were patients and they're now back in the community, they're, they're almost unrecognizable. Right. It's a very strange experience to me when you bump into somebody and they're not wearing a gown and they're not, you know, looking up at you pleadingly and they're acting, they're interacting with you on far more of an equal level. And it's that equal level that I love. It's that delight I take in sharing a joke with somebody or, or mm -hmm. seeing them after they've been in our hospital. And so I just want to see more of that connection and connection within ourselves you know, whether we stop being so work obsessed and get out and enjoy nature, connection within our families so that we stop going to family reunions all the time and talking about work, uh, which is quite tedious, I find, outside of the workplace. Mm. And, and equally, whether it's with our patients and our neighbors and our families, I just think we need a greater sense of community. And I, I think that's why people on all sides are feeling quite a bit of distress in this otherwise glorious, privileged, pampered society we live in, I'm not convinced people are overall happier or as happy right. as they ought to be, given that we finally got all the things that we claimed for so long that we wanted. Sorry to go on. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I love it because it, there's a lot to talk about. And I, I, I mean, I talked about this earlier on, on, the, uh, on an earlier episode about the importance of feeling that community that connection to have that value like feel that value in your in your work and in your life and to to have that level of um, happiness or contentment whatever term you want to use what i'm more curious to, from your perspective is how do we achieve that you know what i'm saying like one of my concerns is when when we see trainees come in they want they want to learn how to save lives they want to know how to manage that my like that heart attack, how to fix that ankle that's broken. And I'm wondering how can we teach that the importance of that connection, number one, and number two, what can we all be doing like from a practical point of view to try and create that that level of connection? Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful question and I may not have the answers. Of course, of course, of course, everybody should be learning how to save a life, how to fix an ankle. In fact, I, I mean, I'm a huge proponent for all of us maintaining our general skills. Yeah. It bothers me enormously that I've forgotten how to deliver a baby and to cast an arm and, and things that I think are just... You are not delivering any of my children, for sure. Well, there's, there's enough of them, from what I understand, that it... Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> No, I, I won't deliver any of your babies. You you have my, you have my word. Uh, oh God! But to me, those are general doctoring skills. And in fact, one of the awful things we do to patients is when they come in, and to patients and families, a doctor is a doctor is a doctor. And instead, we pass the whole thing up into little areas that we're comfortable with and little areas that we don't engage with. Uh, and so the poor person comes in and says, "I have chest pain," and we say, "Your troponin's normal." And the poor patient's left there thinking, I didn't come in to find out what my troponin was. I came out to find out why I, why I have chest pain and far more importantly, to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a perfect example, or not a perfect example, that's an example of how we deliver what we want rather than what the patient wants. Now, the patient doesn't always know what they want in the same way that you and I don't always know what they need and how to deliver it. So let's not assume we have all the answers. The reason I think we need the community and connection is because you literally can't work out what somebody needs until you work out who they are. And so they come in with fear. They come in with a sense of vulnerability and, and we throw pills at them. And, and on some level that helps. 
but on other levels it doesn't because it doesn't actually address the root problem they came in with. I mean, as I say, we've introduced this, it's a four letter word, the system, um, but this uh, electronic <laughs> charting and we are increasingly not connecting with the patients. We're connecting with the screen. And in fact, they can't even see us because we're looking at a screen. And so we seem to be yep. in our quest for data and precision and to avoid error. Now, there's a fascinating discussion about safety one versus safety two. So I think even there, we're oversimplifying the safety discussion or in fact, using that as an excuse. But we're further disconnecting from patients. So absolutely, we need to teach trainees when they come in the basic essential parts that make you a doctor and make you appear to be a doctor to the public. And in fact, we need to maintain all of those general skills, not become increasingly subspecialized. But at the same time, we're saving lives. We have to teach people to save deaths. And mm. it's still not in the curriculum, the real curriculum or the hidden curriculum. There is this sense of, oh, I don't want to talk about that. Uh, surely there's a new piece of Fandango equipment that I can try. You know, I, I work with a lot of patients who've had strokes and increasingly octogenarians are coming in with strokes that we know, even if things go well, this person's life is going to dramatically change. And we, of course, we save some lives, but how many people do we rob of, I'll say this as bluntly as I can, going out at the top of their game? You know, being a strong, independent 80-year-old who then had a devastating illness and in the old days would have passed away. Now, the fact that they were strong and independent is now used as the justification for, there must be a kinder word than flogging them, but then subjecting them to all of these things. So now the justification is, but he's a good 80 something. That's an interesting point. And you can't help but think as an ICU doctor, and this is where the world weariness comes in and the burnout comes in and this sense of, oh, for goodness sake, can't we offer them something else? that we say, okay, he's a good 80, so let's not stop until he's a bad 80. Uh, and that <laughs> seems really unfortunate to me. I heard about a fascinating thing in the UK, which takes a bit of setting up because it can sound a bit authoritarian. But they have talked about saying to patients and their families, rather than this third-line chemotherapy, and, and we know that third-line chemotherapy is third-line because it doesn't work as well as first-line or second-line, rather than this third-line chemotherapeutic, which costs, let's say, £30,000, we will give you, let's say, £3,000. And with that £3,000, you can connect with your family. You can take that trip you always wanted to. Wow. You can... Now, there is a danger that people will hear that and say, oh, how dare you? You're just trying to cheap out on people at end of life and, and save the money on the expensive chemotherapeutics. Now, that's a valid argument. That's a valid discussion. But at the same time, what do people really want? There was a fascinating study done. Now, it was a questionnaire, so it's got all the problems of a questionnaire. But it was basically asking people how much life would they give up for a good death? Because it's a certainty, it's coming to every one of us. Now, I don't want to get nihilistic and say everybody's going to die, so what's the point? That's not my point at all. I accept that life is a terminal event. I'm certainly not suggesting nobody gets treated. For goodness sake, I'm an ICU doctor. I run into the hospital. I run to the emergency room all the time. Do I run? I, I, I move briskly. Yeah. But but people seemed, if, if this study is to believe, be believed, now, a quarter of people wouldn't answer the questionnaire. They, they said they wouldn't give up any time. So fair oh. enough. But of those that did, the range was eight months to 24 months. And I think it's a useful self-reflection of how much life would you give up for a good death? Because mm -hmm. if the low end is eight months and the high end is 24, well, for goodness sake, if you look at the mortality in our intensive care units, now for all comers, it's fabulous in that it's only about 10 to 15%. In other words, we've got 
85 to 90 percent survival. That's fantastic. But that's for all comers. Once you start looking at our medical patients and our multimorbid patients and our frail patients, and I think frailty is something that should be taught to med schools across the land, then you, you are approaching 40, 50 percent mortality within six months. It may not happen in the ICU, so out of sight, out of mind, but that's the problem. And so if you're bringing somebody into the ICU, putting them through all of that the ICU entails, and then there's a high likelihood they're going to die within six months, and then there's a likelihood that they would have given up those months to have a good death, then you really need to challenge what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And it's far too easy to look the other way because... If I bring them to the ICU, I get prestige by doing that. I kid myself, albeit temporarily, that it's a fantastic job. Look at me saving lives. I get well paid, very well paid for doing this work. And the families get a sense of, look, we fought for dad. Uh, Aren't we good kids? And again, I'm not knocking that because I'm a son myself. Um, Mm -hmm. But all the time... What about the poor patient and and where are we going as a society? Now, I'm not talking about the money here because for goodness sake, if taxpayers' monies should be used for anything, it's for people who have played by the rules and paid their taxes and been members of the community and been our teachers and our bus drivers and our, you know, our friends and our neighbors. That's how you build community. But I feel we're losing the losing the plot of it when we say, well, Here's the way we're going to say thank you to you for being a teacher, a bus driver, a member of our community. We're going to flog you with machines. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of where I'm at. Now, I think Mm -hmm. that's a natural journey for anyone who has a febrile mind uh, and likes to think and likes to ponder the bigger meanings and is 20 years in a career. So there is a danger that this can be viewed as, oh, he's burnt out. Oh, he needs to change career. He needs to quit. You know, in the same way, I would never give up my passport if I disagreed with what my government was doing. I don't want to quit my profession or my specialty just because I don't like where we're going. I'd I'd rather be in the middle of the, I would normally have said fight, but (laughs) I'm tired of fighting too. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to be in the middle of this debate, which will take a long time to sort out because culture change never occurs overnight. Mm -hmm. And one of our other problems is we want quick fixes. When, whereas this will take years of engagement, debate, discussion, back and forth, people calling bullshit on doctors and saying, suck it up, buttercup, this is what people want, and you are paid a hefty wage, so deliver it, which there's some validity to that. And you and I on the other side saying, yep, I, I get your point. Can I just have 30 seconds just to argue whether this is what he would want or not? And the flip exactly. side is it sometimes takes a bit of time for this to play out. In other words, you know, this idea that we all go to Tim Hortons and have a three hour conversation with our families and say, this is what I want, this is what I not want, is absolutely what we should be doing. But at the same time, you can't cover all eventualities. You know, if I take my stroke, stroke example, you can't say, well, if I have a stroke, don't do anything, because then that argues the question, well, just a second, big stroke, small stroke, brainstem stroke, MCA stroke and on and on and on. So you can't cover all eventualities. But if you are more connected to your family, your community, your loved ones, your pals, this will be easier because there will be a general sense of, well, overall, we've been in this for two days. He's not getting better. I promise you, this is what he did say over beer. This is what he would have said around the campfire. You know, my mm-hmm. my own end of life is not a lawyer's document. We've all seen those lawyer's documents that yeah. say that not say helpful. No, they 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 help us have a conversation if there's reluctance to even have a conversation. We can pull out the personal directive and say, well no, 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 no. This person signed this, so we owe it to them to have a discussion. But at the same time the language that says if a catastrophic event occurs, don't use heroic measures to sustain my life. Well, then all that does is force you to say, well, what's catastrophic, what's heroic, and what's sustain versus revive? And so that doesn't really help. So my end of life is is fairly straightforward. It is that my wife, because I don't want her to have to make the decision, because that feels mean and cowardly, is to phone three of my friends. And if three of my friends say, you know what, 
this isn't what he would want, then I'm not suggesting it's going to be simple, but it's at least straightforward. It's a and, guide. And, and, and all of that is community and connection and friends that you feel comfortable enough entrusting because you're connected to them and entrusting because you've spoken to them and shared a few laughs. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, these are conversations that occur on ski hills with pints in our hands around campfires. In other words, they are at those moments when you truly connect. So I want us to connect so that we connect. I want us to connect so that we're taken care of ahead of time. And I want my life support. Here's where I'm going to get really Oprah on you. I want my life support to be my friends and my family, not machines. Wow. And I mean, there's so much there, Peter. There's the idea. I don't know where to start. The The idea, number one, of I, th I don't think people really know what a, a death in the ICU looks like or what the experience is like. That's one thought I wanted to express. Second was... You know, I know it's maybe taboo to talk about the financial implications, but I think it's we have a responsibility to, to do it. And I think because of we want to be able to provide quality care for those that that will benefit. OK, and I think one of the major problems in the discussions we're having is as we're providing care for people that will not benefit. And I think when you come down to the moral distress and the issues around that, that's a big concern. And I think a lot of these discussions, the, that, that community sense that we, get, we, get, we should be more striving for, that will help us to have more appropriate use of our, our, our resources. Knowing that we've had that connection, we know what dad would want, we know what mom would want based on, on, our, uh, on that connection. And, but I, I guess my, the, what I'm fumbling to say is that I think there is a responsibility to talk about what the financial implications are, because I want when it's my time or whatever, and I need that, I might need that, you know, $300,000, you know, intervention. I want there to be, be able to, I want it to be able to happen. You know what I'm saying? I want I, I'll go even further than that. I, I completely agree with you. I don't think it is taboo to talk about this. In fact, I think it's cowardly not to talk about it because there are consequences to mm -hmm. uh, wasting money. Maybe that's too hard. Squandering money. Maybe that's too hard. But misdirecting money is certainly not too hard. And so mm -hmm. there are profound implications to spending taxpayers' money. This, this is a societal resource. You don't own it. I don't own it. And in fact, the government doesn't own it either. They just manage it on behalf of all of us. And so if you and I are squandering money on healthcare that isn't providing a patient with what they want, and I don't mean more heartbeats and more breaths, I mean what they want in, in the larger sense that you and I have been talking about, something that gives them joy and connection and, and life. And, and it doesn't have to be life where you're on a mountain bike or on skis, you know, that's not going to be the reality of my later life. It's going to be sitting in a chair, but still going for walks and still connecting with people. So it doesn't have to be a rigorous physical life, but it does need to be one of connection. And so I think we mm -hmm. have to talk about this stuff. Now, I think I'm actually, maybe it's the Englishman in me, but I'm of the belief that constraints are good for us. There was a wonderful... What do you mean? thought experiment by the guitarist Jack Black, where he said, tell me which of these situations is going to produce a better album. You've got all the time in the, money, in the world, all the money in the world, and all the backup in the world, or you've got a short time period, you've got a guitar with one broken string, and you have a limited yes. budget. And we know which one's going to produce a better album. Now, we're yes. not producing albums here, but we are providing for patience in a, in a sort of spiritual connective way that that isn't that far off from music and mm. so if we have unlimited budgets if don't even talk about dollars and cents my worry is we'll get even more biomedical and we'll just slap people on ecmo machines and so i actually think the constraints are good for us now if I can go further than that, though, obviously, and I'm not original in saying this, but every dollar that you and I spend on behalf of the patient is one dollar less for sanitation, early childhood development, community programs. There's a fascinating 
couple of studies that have been done on villages and towns that have decided that the cure for modern illness is connection. Mm. And so they have provided people in the community to help out with loneliness, to help that person whose issue is not that their knee is busted, their issue is more that they can't get out of the house. And they're actually attacking it at the root point, which is, I can't get out of the house. It's not that my you know, lateral collateral ligament, blah, blah, blah. Yes, they're both two ways of looking at the same problem. But but the focus from those community-based things is getting people back into society, not just coming up with the right Latin description. Now, Latin description for their illness. Now, we are all in the business of healthcare, every single one of us, given that the budget that's available for teachers, the budget that's available for community projects is nowadays essentially what's left over from the healthcare budget because it's the number one expenditure as I understand it. Now, Canada's quite clever and it hides it in provincial budgets versus federal budgets. So it's, it's a little tough to work out exactly what healthcare costs, but we know that health and education are the, are the numbers one and two. Something mm-hmm. has to be the numbers one and two, and I think health and education should be the numbers one and two. But there was a very interesting series of articles down in the US where they argued that the number one cost of building a truck or a car in the US is the healthcare costs of the workers for GM, Ford, and Chevy. Mm-hmm. Now, this is a country that has private healthcare, so let's you know, bring the model to our countries where we're all sort of getting our health care provided in the same way that workers for Ford or Chevy would have done. Now, if that's the number one cost and it's justifiable health care costs, fantastic. If it isn't, it becomes yet another reason why Ford and Chevy and others have outsourced building cars to other countries with shocking records on healthcare provision with with a model that I don't want to emulate at all. But my bigger point is we're all in the healthcare business because if you and I squander healthcare budgets, it makes our economy non-competitive. It steals money from our kids and our neighbors' kids in terms of the community-based literacy, in terms of play, in terms of early education, those things that make a profound impact on our quality of life, as opposed to vast sums of money that instead are just being injected into the last two to three months of somebody's life on the planet. Mm. And so I, it's not that I want expenditure to be cut. It's not that I want us to stop spending money, period. It's just I want more of a discussion about there's finite funds, are they better put into the first part of your life when you're healthy or the last part of your life when we might be lucky, but we sort of think we know how this plays out. Yeah. It's insane when you look at how, like, we know how beneficial investing in, like, early child development and and the community, we know the benefits, but it's part of the problem, that not to get too political, it's that, you know, our politicians got budgets that they need to b- balance and they, they get elected every four years. So they always, you know, that long-term play comes to, comes out of consequence. You know what I'm saying? And it's, it, it's too bad. No. And that's absolutely true. I, I don't, I'm not angry towards our politicians though. They're just stuck within the confines of, of, of their rule book as well. In other right. words, they, you know, can you imagine a politician saying, let's spend less on quaternary healthcare and more on connectivity. And they would say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, no, oh, he's, he's lost his marbles. And how exactly would you see us doing that? So I, I, you know, I, I don't feel anger towards our politicians. I share the same sort of sense of exasperation that they probably do. And in fact, it's way too easy to blame others. And so, you know, I try desperately as a doctor and, and as an administrative doctor to avoid doing the old, oh, if only they would give us more funds, or if only they would do as we tell them to. It's an incredibly complicated discussion that part of our job, I think, as specialists, medical specialists, is being involved in the discussion and in the debate. And that's one Mm -hmm. of the reasons why I ramble on. It's also one of the reasons why I write and try to engage and give lectures. 
because it's it's important for me as a person to get those thoughts straight in my own head. I feel like I grow as a person by doing so. But I also feel it's part of my societal obligation to be a small part of that debate. Um, mm -hmm. I, I feel I feel sorry for our politicians or our administrators. They are stuck too. I feel sorry for patients. They're stuck too. You know, mm -hmm. the Europe Palliative Care Doctor, incredibly important work. But look at how we let down the side when it comes to palliative care. Perhaps in, in your city, home palliative care is a great thing. It's very difficult where I live to no, provide care where the person wants it and where the per person feels comfortable, which is why we end up rushing people in with palliative disease and you know who can blame them the poor wife or husband sees the person they love more than anyone else in the world struggling to get their breath of course they're going to phone for medical backup and of course unfortunately that medical backup is going to rush them into the hospital and then when they arrive in the hospital a guy like you or i comes down and says why the hell are you calling me often mm -hmm. in to the poor patient they're palliative. There's nothing the ICU can offer for them. And you get upset, I get upset, the nurse gets upset, the family gets upset. And all that person wanted was for the shortness of breath to go away. And instead, right. you know, we all fight. We send them for a pulmonary embolus CT scan because one of us is smart enough to remember that palliative cancer is associated with clotting. So we send them to a scanner and then they come back and we go, no, nah, you don't have a clot. So uh, I'm just going to sign off here. <laughs> this poor patient is just stuck in the middle of all of these people claiming they're caring for them, but sort of not really. They're sort of all trying to say, how can I not be involved in this situation? And so it's to me, it's a lamentable mess that I would like to see slowly improve over the course of my last decade in this glorious profession that I'm delighted I'm still a member of and that I always wanted to be a member of and have never wanted to do another job. And, and that's mm -hmm. where I feel for other, I feel for patients, I hope that's clear, but I also feel for other healthcare workers because I, I fear many people have entered the profession having read the side of the tin and now have opened the tin and are looking inside and thinking, ah, that's not quite what I thought I would be doing. I thought I would be helping patients get better, helping patients reconnect with their old lives, but I'm not. Now, you and I need to find meaning in that, and we need to say, well, it's not right, so I'm going to fix it, not it's not right, so I'm going to walk away. Mm -hmm. And that the, the midlife crisis of healthcare that I think a lot of people will go through and that I went through but at the same time, I never disengaged. Does that make yeah. sense? No, absolutely. And I honestly, when I talk to a lot of future intensivists or future trainees and whatever specialty they're doing, like a lot of us have the same skill set, right? Like we all can resuscitate someone, we could do the procedures. But what, in my opinion, that makes a lasting impression and, and, and what makes a true difference is that connection with the family the connection with the the patient and helping them navigate through this horrible condition that they're in. Right. And this is where we, in my opinion, truly make that difference. You know, like that's that time you sat down, that time you held his hand, his or her hand, that time you looked them directly in the eye, not in front of not staring at the, you know, the new electric uh, electronic medical record uh, computer or whatever. It's that connection time, and that that can leave such an impression on not only the the, the family, but on the t on uh, um, the team even, and the and the kids who I call the trainees. They they learn from that. It's it's just such an important thing to do, and um, I, I, I that's where I think we 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 can make more of a difference. And I completely agree. And and rather than that being pessimistic, this is not a pessimistic conversation. This means as a healthcare provider, you are going to spend the first, let's say, 10 years of your career learning the medical stuff so that you can deliver it quickly, efficiently, slickly. You can save lives. You will then likely spend the rest of your career learning this stuff. In other words, you can only say it won't work when you know how it does work. So you shouldn't mm -hmm. have people coming in at the very front end and saying, ah, this isn't the life that passes my tick box of a quality life. No, no, no. 
you've got to learn how to resuscitate people. You're going to learn how to put in an IV. You've got to learn how to disimpact a bowel, put in a Foley catheter. Because you know what? Those things cause patients immense discomfort. Mm-hmm. And, and, and your job is to relieve that discomfort, not to do glamorous work that you find exciting. So, mm-hmm. so rather than this being a pessimistic conversation where the message should not be you get 15 years into your career and you think, oh, what's the point? It's quite different than that. It's that you learn a skill set. It's exciting. You can save lives with it and you will save lives with it. But then you will spend the rest of your career saving deaths. You will spend the rest of your career being part of the solution, not just complaining. Mm -hmm. You will rather than, you know, you might go through a few shaky years where you think, for goodness sake, I should quit and be a postman. But then you'll hopefully re-engage and say, okay, I've, I've had my pity party. Now I'm going to get back in and try and improve the system. Uh, Time to dance again. (laughs) Exactly. Now it's interesting. You mentioned the dance. Uh, I got a very good friend from New Zealand who, who summarized some of my frustrations by saying, yeah, yeah, that's, that's just the medical dance. You have to learn the dance. Yeah. And I asked him exactly what he meant. And he said, well, part of the dance is the family comes in expecting everything. You feel like it's not going to be beneficial but you administer it anyway. Then they get angry with you because they haven't gotten better. And then you get angry with them because they're getting angry with you and and back and forth, back and forth. And these are just the steps in the dance. And, you know, why are you ordering a CAT scan? Well, because it's part of the dance. And and I I thought he crystallized a lot of the the, the frustrations I was thinking about, this sort of general sense of, oh, here we go again. Does it have to be like this Mm -hmm. every time? And that's just what I hope for the rest of my career is that we get beyond all the fighting and then we just get back to connecting. Now, I'm a more than 220 pound white male. I, <laughs> I can do fighting. I can keep doing it. It's easy. I was raised for it. I was raised on the rugby fields. Uh, I just get a little tired of it. Yeah. And I don't think it's what I want as a person because I bring it home. And start mm. fighting with people who had nothing to do with the fight in the first place. Or I take it on to the next patient who doesn't deserve what I dragged from the last patient. Or right. they bring their fight from the last time they interacted with a healthcare professional. And, you know, being angry, being upset, and squabbling, beating our chest is the easiest emotion in the world, which is why we default to it but it's not usually the best or the most appropriate emotion for that situation. And so Mm. if there's any wisdom in healthcare, let's provide that wisdom as we get on in our careers. Amen, brother. That's wisdom right there. Thanks everybody for listening to episode 26 with Peter Brindley. I hope you enjoyed that. For those that want to leave any comments, leave them at quadcast99 at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube at Quadcast. Thank you to our sponsors, BetterHelp and Audible. See the links in the show notes uh, for signing up for either of them. And uh, we appreciate you uh, supporting the show in that way. If you're up to it, leave a five-star rating on iTunes. It helps grow the show. I also want to thank our team members, show notes crew, social media crew. Y'all are killing it. And we love the support you're doing for the show. So thank you so much. Can't wait to talk to you guys next time. Thanks for listening.